Okay, I'm going to get started. So, uh, so this is my last uh, talk in the series, and uh, what I'm going to do today is I'll uh, tell you what I wanted to finish up with yesterday. So I, I want to tell you uh, something about protocol compression. So yesterday we talked about uh, we we showed how to how to give a lower bound on the randomized communication complexity of disjointness, and in that proof we we saw that that. Uh, a key idea is to understand the information that's communi communicated by a protocol. Uh, and then I told you briefly about this problem of understanding direct sums in communication complexity. And there also the, the concepts of information uh, theory are very useful. So one concept that comes out uh, of all of this is the information complexity of a protocol, okay? uh, which uh, I defined here. So the information complexity of a private coin protocol uh, is uh, expressed there, so the inputs are x and y, and the messages exchanged in the protocol are m. Then the first quantity kind of captures how much information Alice reveals to Bob, okay? And the second quantity captures how much information uh, Bob reveals to Alice during the execution of the protocol. So that's a quantity you can measure, and then, then uh, maybe the most interesting problem uh, here, and uh, it's, it's a, a space where we still do not understand the picture uh, at all completely, uh, is if you know that the information complexity uh, has certain values, what can you say about the most efficient way to, comp to actually execute the protocol? Right? Like if, if the information was zero, that means that really the protocol says nothing about the inputs and you actually don't need to send any messages. You could just you know, sample the messages independently. Uh, but if it's not zero, you know, how, many, how many bits do you need to communicate in order to simulate the protocol? Okay, so that's, that's the, uh, maybe the most interesting question that's still open, uh, or one of the most interesting questions that's still open. So let me tell you what we do know today. Uh, uh, so the, the, first, the first result I want to tell you, which I will more or less show you the proof of, is this bound, which says that uh, essentially you can always simulate the messages using communication that's like, uh, that behaves like the geometric mean between the information and the communication of the original protocol. Okay, so that's that bound. Uh, that was uh, proved by Brevimen, uh, Barak, Chen, and myself. Um, <coughs> uh, and then following that, there was uh, work of uh, Braverman, which uh, recently uh, Ram Murthy and myself uh, improved a little bit to get this bound, uh, which says that uh, you can kind of get, a, get something that's independent of uh, the length of the messages in the original protocol, uh, but then it has an exponential dependence on the information. Okay, so here the, there's something that depends on the length of the messages in the original protocol. Here there's no dependence, but then you, you pay for it by having sort of this exponential dependence on the information. Uh, and this same paper with Ram Murthy, we also showed that, uh, that you can get some kind of bound like this uh, which, which looks better, which can look better than this in some situations. So some, there's some kind of w w asymmetric relationship between uh, Alice and Bob. So sort of, so what, like what this bond says also is that, uh, you know, if Alice is revealing very little information, but Bob is revealing a lot, then you can do pretty well. You can get close to the information complexity of the, the whole protocol. Uh, and then there was a really beautiful lower bound that was proved uh, in the last couple of years. Um, can't raise this. Okay. Uh, by uh, Ganor, Cole, and Raz, which says uh, that uh, uh, essentially, you know, two to the IA plus IB uh, communication is required. In other words, there is a protocol and which has information this much, um, but there's no com there's no way to simulate it using communication that's less than this quantity. Uh, no, because this has uh, yeah okay. It's because I'm ignoring constant factors. Yeah, so everywhere there are constants here. Okay. 
Yeah. So it doesn't beat it. The last line uh, yeah, it's probably because I'm ignoring constant factors, or maybe I actually, why is the, why is the last line? Oh, because this is 2 to the IB. Um, yeah, so there's a constant here in the exponent. So actually, so here maybe there's like, so this is order, okay, and this is omega. So that's why it's not a contradiction. So, you know, this, this, this quantity can be much smaller than that. Well, I mean, it's also important that it's, there exists IA and IB. Yeah. Because otherwise, I could plug in IB is 2 to the block, you know, I mean, something much, much larger. Oh, I see. OK. So maybe, maybe I'll, I'll try to stick to, OK, so I didn't think this through carefully. So let me, let me tell you exactly. In their, exact, in their example, actually, IA and IB are the same. OK, so actually, it's. Uh, so that's why it's important that there exists. OK. So. Yeah, so it's actually, you know, there exists M such that, you know, IA is equal to IB. Okay, so this is already 2 to the I, whatever it is. It's the same I. And uh, here you have uh, omega 2 to the I. Okay, so. Or IA plus IB, it's the same. Okay, so, so, so it says that if, if you're bound, if you're going to compress to something that does not depend on the communication, then you're going to have an exponential dependence on the information. <coughs> you can't avoid that. Um, OK, good. Uh, and uh, uh, Makran and I, uh, s since then, have a, uh, well, since then, there are stronger results, and also we, uh, we have a, a proof that, that's, uh, that's shorter. Uh, so th th this is an active area of research, and it's still far from done. OK, so we don't know that these results are how far from being tight they are. All right, um, so now I want to tell you uh, at least one compression result, so I'm going to tell you this one. Uh, so, so you're given a protocol, okay, which you can think of, you know, it, so, there's some, so there's some distribution on inputs x and y and uh, messages m that you get when you run this protocol. And uh, now we want to somehow generate those messages, but we don't want to run the protocol. We don't want to send that many bits, right? We want to save on the, the amount of communication. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to use public randomness to try and sort of sample most of the messages in some sense, OK? Uh, <clears throat> so so here's, here's the public randomness that we'll use. So imagine that. Uh, uh, so imagine that, suppose, okay, so say m is, suppose m is uh, uh, l bits, okay, l bits long, so the communication is l bits. <coughs> uh, and and I, I'm, I'm also going to make one more assumption just so that the notation is easier, but uh, it's not really needed in the proof. I'm going to assume that uh, m1, uh, m3, all the odd bits are sent by ALS. And uh, all the even bits, m2, m4, are sent by Bob. Okay. This doesn't really make the problem uh, easier. Um, and we don't really need it, but it'll make the, the description that I'm going to show you uh, easier to present. OK, so that's the, that's the setup. And now we want to sample uh, this m with small communication. So before I, I so let, let me tell you first what ra public randomness we'll use. So the idea is that we're going to use some public randomness, and then we're going to communicate a little bit, and at the end we'll be left with an M, which has the property that this joint distribution is exactly the same uh, as it was in the original protocol. Okay. <clears throat> so what is our randomness going to be? Uh, so Alice, so Alice has the setup is Alice has X. Bob has y. Uh, and what the randomness is going to be is going to be uh, L random numbers, row 1, uh, row 2, so on, to row L. Okay? So there's one random number for every one of these bits. And each number is uh, just a number between 0 and 1. Uh, and what's going to happen is Alice and Bob will communicate. And uh, I'm going to tell you 
what m they're going to output. Okay? The m that they're going to output will be determined by row 1 through row l. Okay? It will just be determined by row 1 through row l and their, and their x and y. <coughs> so the m that they will output will be this m. So I'll tell you what m1 is. m1 is just going to be, uh, it's, you know, each one of these, you know, m1 is a bit. So m1 will be 1 uh, if and only if row 1 uh, is less than the probability that m1 equals uh, 1 given xy. And then m2 will be 1 if and only if row 2 is less than the probability that m2 uh, is equal to 1 given x, y, m, and so on. Oh, m1. So, but, but that's just in my head because, so I start with a private random protocol, then I produce a shared random protocol. Uh, in the end, I can always, so remember, this protocol is achieving something with this inputs x and y, and x and y are some distribution. So I can, in the end, fix the, the shared randomness to get a deterministic protocol that achieves the same goal. Okay? But to argue that this is correct, I'm going to use the shared randomness. Okay, so this is, I'm now describing just the M that will be output. I haven't told you how we're going to figure out what this M, you know, compute this M. So both L's and must, so L's will have both output at one as well, or? They will both output, they will both in their, after they run this protocol, they will both know the value of this N. Okay, yeah, all the way. So this M, L will be, uh, so they will compute this M, which will be, which will satisfy these properties. Okay, so that's, that's what we're going to achieve. Now, one thing that should be clear when you look at this is that uh, the distribution of the M is exactly the right distribution, right? The probability M1 is equal to 1 is exactly correct. It's, the, it's exactly this probability. The probability M2 is equal to 1 given any fixing of M1 is exactly correct. So all the marginals are correct, so all the conditional probabilities are correct, so the overall distribution of M is correct. So we don't have to worry about that. Uh, yeah. Now, yeah, but, you know, first of all, the first question is, who knows these numbers, right? No. Nobody, because I have both x and y, so you have a problem. Okay, so they, they can't even compute these numbers, so they don't, they don't know m at all. But let's look at the first number. The first number, actually, someone does know it. Alice knows it, because this actually, this number is equal to the probability that m1 equals 1 given x. Because uh, once you fix x, uh, in the, this m1 was sent by Alice in the original protocol. So the distribution of m1 is independent of y after you fix x. So that's the, because this is, m1 is coming from a protocol. Similarly, the second number is actually known to Bob, almost. Bob doesn't know M1, right? But if Bob knew M1, Bob would know the second number. Right? So this is the probability that M2 is equal to 1 given uh, Y and M1. Okay, and that, so that goes on throughout. <coughs> okay, so that's, that's very good. Now, now, so now I'm going to tell you the actual protocol for how to sample this. So the protocol will look like this. Yes. Yeah. So so far I haven't told you how a protocol. I've just told you what we're aiming to sample. 
and we've proved that it has the right distribution. Now we just need to figure out how to sample it using low communication. Okay. <clears throat> so this is what we'll do. So as soon as, as soon as Alice and Bob start, they look at these numbers, and they come up with the best guess for M from their perspective. So what is the best guess for M? Uh, they will just run this process, but instead of these numbers, they will just use the estimates that they have. Okay, so they will use just given x. Alice will just use given x everywhere. So Alice will compute, so Alice computes uh, a string ma, where sort of uh, ma1 is equal to 1, if and only if rho 1 is at most the probability of uh, uh, m1 uh, equals 1, given x. Okay, so that's going to be, this this bit is going to be exactly right, okay. But the second bit, she'll do like this. She does the same process, except she uses here the numbers where everywhere she conditions just on x. Uh, M uh, two here, right? So she'll set the second bit exactly like the correct, but she doesn't know this number. She just uh, conditions on the value of only on of her input. Okay, so that's. Uh, what doesn't depend on her input? Uh, once you fix y, it doesn't depend. But before you fix y, it could depend because x and y are themselves correlated. Okay. Well, I mean, here this has to be some. This is something in the probability space P. Okay, so I'm just viewing, you know, so this is the M, X, Y that come from this probability space. So for it to make sense, there's no M1 to the A in this probability space. Okay, so I'm viewing this as the variables that they're setting, and this is the numbers which are coming from the probability space. Ah, oh, I see, I see, I see what you're, I see what you're objecting to. Okay, so it should be like this. Now it makes sense, maybe. <laughs> yeah. OK, good. Uh, OK, and Bob does exactly the same. So Bob computes. Uh, MB, uh, MB1 is equal to 1, exactly when row 1 Okay, and so on. So that's the first step. Now, okay, what, what, do we, what happened so far? If you look at the first bit, Alice got it correct, right? That's, uh, Alice computed the first bit perfectly well. Uh, but Bob probably made a mistake, or probably didn't get it right. Okay. Uh, and Bob probably got nothing right, because once, once you get one thing that's wrong, you know, everything is probably uh, wrong because you don't have the right conditioning. <clears throat> so what they're going to do next is find the first uh, difference. So find the smallest uh, j such that mj uh, a is not equal to mj b. Okay, <clears throat> and to do that, they will communicate. Okay, so they'll communicate with each other to find the first place where they disagree, and as soon as they find where they disagree, they'll kind of know whose bit was right. Right. For example, if if j is equal to one, then they will know that Alice sampled the first bit correctly, so it was Bob that made the mistake. So Bob will fix his sample. So Bob will fix the sample, and they will just repeat the process. They will now uh, do the rest of the string uh, over, again, using this process, and again, find the first bit where they disagree. And, and to find the smallest they just uh, communicate to each other over the previous bit? No, that's where they save. 
So to do this, you actually only need uh, order log of the length of m communication. Okay, and that's, that's because we described uh, in my first lecture that if you have two n-bit strings and you want to find the first point where they disagree, you can do that in log n bits of communication by using hashing. So you use a random hash and do binary search, and you'll find the first location quickly. Okay, so that's where the big saving is. So you don't need to communicate a lot, only log m bits to find the first point of difference, and you just repeat this. So, so, so recompute and uh, repeat. Repeat until, until we're done, okay? So until we have all the bits correctly. Okay, so the idea is, uh, right, so as soon as they find the smallest j where, uh, uh, where uh, they disagree, then because they know whose turn was to speak in the protocol, actually even without that assumption that Alice sends the odd bits, Bob knows the even bits, they would know whose turn it was to speak in the protocol, the way protocols are defined. So they would just know who made the mistake and that person would correct and then they would rerun the rest of the things and, and repeat, find the next bit. And clearly, when the protocol terminates, it has to be the case that MA is equal to MB, and moreover, that string is equal to this. It's equal to the string that we wanted to sample. Okay. Because every bit, you know, one of them has the right number. So overall, they must all you know, have the right number, right numbers. Okay, so the, the only thing we need to figure out now is what is the communication of this protocol. Okay. And the communication of this protocol is exactly, you know, it all comes from step two, right? So we just need to count how many times did step two happen? How many times did, was there a mistake? And that's exactly where we're going to use the information. Right? So if there was a mistake sort of for every value of j, we didn't save anything. In fact, we increased the communication by a factor of log m. But the hope is that if the information is small, then the chance of a mistake will be very small. Right? Intuitively, if the information is zero, then actually the, the numbers like rho, the number that, that uh, Bob is using for the first bit will be exactly equal to the number that Alice is using. So they won't make a mistake. Okay, that's, the, that's the intuition. Okay, and to formalize that, we're going to use uh, Pinsker's inequality. So let me remind you what that is. So it says uh, the mutual information between, oh sorry, the L1 distance between uh, uh, between uh, A given B uh, and uh, just A, that's bounded by uh, two to the square root mutual information between A and B. And the way we're gonna use that is we're just going to count, uh, we, we're just gonna count uh, the probability that there's a mistake in the jth step. So I'll say there's a mistake in the jth step if uh, for, for j, j was found in the second step at some point. Okay. So there's a mistake, so a mistake in j step. Uh, means j was found. Uh, and now I want to count, so what I'm basically going to do is I'm going to uh, count the expected number of mistakes by bounding for each j, what is the probability that there's a mistake in the jth step? Oh, what did I do? <laughs> I'm still a little in the, that side of the board with the exponentials. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, that makes sense. <laughs> Oh, you really let me go a lot, get away with that for a very long time. <laughs> what? 
Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm making all kinds of mistakes. Let's say expectation over B. Now it makes sense, right? So it's expectation over B of this L1 distance. That's uh, the square root. Good. Uh, all right, thanks. Any more comments, questions? Okay, so let's, let's compute what is the probability of a mistake in the jth step. Uh, now this is exactly, if you think about it, it's uh, bounded, uh, it's bounded by the L1 distance between, uh, so w when is there a mistake in the jth step? That means all the previous steps, uh, Alice and Bob had exactly the same m values, and in the jth, in the jth position they got it wrong. Okay. So what does that mean? So it means that if you look at mj equals 1, uh, given x and m less than j, uh, I mean, this is, exactly, this is actually exactly what it is. Because, you know, so, you know, suppose Alice and Bob have uh, these numbers for these estimates. If rho j lands here, there's not going to be a mistake. They will make, make the this output the same value. If rho j lands here, there's not going to be a mistake. The only way there can be a mistake, they get different values, is if rho j uh, lands here between the two numbers. So that's the probability that there is a mistake. And uh, okay, so suppose j is odd. Uh, then this, as we said, so that's the difference. Uh, actually, so I'll make this inequality. So I'm, I'm going to get rid of this mj equals 1. It's just the L1 distance between mj. Here we have uh, j is odd. So this is xy m less than j minus mj y m less than j. Okay, and uh, so I guess, uh, so, I re so if, I, if I want to do it on average over x, y, and the randomness is the expectation of this quantity over x uh, m less than j. x, y, m less than j. Uh, and, and now I'm just going to use Pinsker. OK, so this, the expected value of this, uh, this L1 distance by Pinsker is bounded by the square root of the mutual information between uh, uh, m, j, and uh, x given y and m less than j. Okay, so, right, so, you know, if the information that, so intuitively, if the information that Bob was going to learn in the step uh, was epsilon, then the, his estimate must be off by s at most square root epsilon for the probability of this message. So the chance you make a mistake is at most square root epsilon. That's what we're doing here. And that's, that's, this is the only lossy part, or this is sort of, I mean, there's also the log. But this is the biggest lossy part of this, uh, of this idea. Okay, the information is only epsilon, but you could make a mistake with square root epsilon probability. Uh, okay, so that's the bound you get, and uh, you know, to make the bound work for whether or not Alice or Bob is speaking, I'm going to throw in the other term. Okay, so this is uh, this. Uh, 
OK, so now this bound, this bound that I wrote here, is just the probability that there's a mistake in jth step, no matter who's speaking. Uh, so if Alice is speaking, it's bounded by one of these terms. And if uh, Bob is speaking, it's bounded by the other term. So overall, it's always bounded by the sum. And that's it. So now we're just going to count the total expected number of mistakes. So the expected number of mistakes is just the sum of these numbers. So it's just equal to the sum over i Oh, sum over j of uh, square root, or it's bounded by uh, and now we should just use the Cauchy Schwartz inequality to get that this is at most. You know, so this is the inner product of the all ones vector with this vector. So I can bound it by square root of the length, the number of uh, coordinates here, times square root, the sum over j of uh, these numbers. OK, and now, now we have, you know, the whole point is the information had a, has a very nice chain rule. So these things add up. And that's equal to square root of m uh, times square root of uh, i a plus i b. Um, sorry, maybe I should be more explicit. So this is i of m with x given y plus i of uh, m with y given x. And that's uh, exactly what we wanted to prove. OK, so. <coughs> uh, Okay, so 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 that's the that's the whole proof. So basically, uh, you know, the wor the worst case is kind of when you when the information is really spread out. So when the information is like epsilon, every bit sort of has epsilon bits of uh, information, then this protocol will do pretty badly. Uh, it will it will do you know that's that's when it'll match this bound. It'll sort of make a mistake with square root epsilon probability uh, in each step, and so there will be. Uh, uh, that many mistakes in, in expectation. Question? So yes. Yeah, so it's a bound in expected communication. Then to get a worst case bound, you can use Markov's inequality. So you can say the probability that the communication is 10 times longer than this is 1 over 10. So uh, you just run the protocol for 10 times longer and stop, just terminate if, if you don't uh, end by that point. Well, that's part of the problem, right? So the assumption is you have an underlying probability space where x, y, and come from. And uh, m is uh, given to you. Maybe you're asking how do you access this or how do you compute this? I don't know if you have a goal, like you want to achieve some uh, i, a, some i, b, and you know, you know. So here I'm thinking of the, the i, a, and i, b as part of the inputs. To the problem, right? That there is an underlying distribution on x and y, and an underlying protocol that I know that I'm given, and that has a certain parameter of performance i and i b, and I want to improve it. And what I'm doing is uh, dealing with that. But if there are some kind of corollary, so if, if you if you have a protocol which is a probabilistic protocol which is, has some parameters for every input, and you have no distribution of input, can you? something out of this for, for this case? Uh, yeah, so there actually is a way to define information in a way uh, that's not distribution dependent. Okay, and this is something that uh, Mark Behrman studied. 
okay, I won't write it, but I'll just say what he did. So he, uh, he actually just, you know, he, he just considered, you can talk about the worst case information of a protocol, namely the maximum over all, or supremum over all distributions of the information of a protocol. And this parameter makes sense. Uh, and, uh, and then you can apply uh, this kind of thing. So, so, so it actually does make sense. So it's not that the, there are protocols for which the worst case information uh, can be small. Okay. Well, I guess that's not too hard to think of. Uh, and then you can, apply, you can apply this idea to get sort of a worst case result that has nothing to do with the distribution. Ah, yeah, that's a, uh, right, uh, but that can also be done. Uh, so that's not trivial, it's not trivial, but it can be done. Uh, so there's a way to sort of say that if, if there's a protocol that works for every distribution, a simulation that works for every simulation, for every distribution, and then there's one that works uh, for all of them. So just a single one that works for all of them. Yeah. Do, do I understand correctly that your protocol, uh, which is there, does not use uh, the distribution of uh, X and Y? So, because it seems that uh, yeah. every, every party uses uh, no particular X or Y, just uses the distribution or coins of that. That's right, yeah. Right? No, no, but, but the, the distribution given, there is a joint distribution, so it in, in change the condition. No. He's talking about just the distribution of X and Y, the marginals and X and Y. Are, you just need to know the dependence, the distribution of M given X and M given Y, uh, rather than. On X and Y, yes. That's right. Um, Any other questions? Yeah. One thing that was confusing me about, I guess, and I said it here makes sense. So here, the function of the Vitali abstracted layer, you just yeah. assume that the, you know, the protocol M somehow computes it, right? You know, even if it doesn't, you keep working with it. Yeah. I'm not sure I understand what you're saying. Like, in the information theory community, if you want to compute the information, you know, the communication complexity of computing a function, well, with some assumptions on the distribution, which is like the ID or something, then you, you, know, you go through a graph, where you compute the, 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 you know, the entropy, the graph entropy of this graph. Okay. Oh, so you're saying you could ask the question, you're given the function, and you don't know anything about the protocol. You're searching over the space of all protocols. Yeah, so that's a, yeah, that's a, that's a different question. That's a... So this is the only one that seems useful for the direct sum problem that I told you about. Uh, and prior to that, people, uh, so there was this paper of Chakrabarti, Sheworth, and Yao where they use a different quantity, uh, and that's this quantity. I mean, this is the most, what I'm writing here is, this is what we call external information, but this is the most natural quantity that you would think of, right? Just how much information is there total? Uh, so this quantity is always uh, smaller, uh, sorry, larger. Okay, so what's written here, that sum is always, can all, is always smaller than this one. And so in some sense, it's more powerful in the sense of compression. So if you, it's easier to bound this thing. Okay, so then you can potentially, if you get something that works in terms of the smaller quantity, you can get better protocols. 
And, and that was kind of what happened. So in the direct sum problem, this is the quantity that shows up. In the disjointness uh, problem in hindsight, this is also the quantity that shows up. So this quantity seems very natural, but for the problems where we're applying these concepts, it tends to be that this one is the one show, showing up, which makes the compression problem harder. And in fact, for this one, we have much better compression results. So we know how to simulate uh, any such protocol with this times polylog m bits of communication. Okay, so we almost have, except for a polylog factor, we have simulations for this quantity. And here, there's a much bigger gap. Here, the best result is essentially this one. Uh, well, I mean, so I guess, I guess what I'd say, I, I, don't, I haven't gone through all the quantities, but, uh, uh, and I'm not sure exactly how you're defining tensorization, but if you could solve the direct sum problem with better parameters, like the best parameters we know come from this. So the direct sum problem has nothing to do with information, right? And this is what seems to work. If you, so if you, if you really want me to get interested in what quantity it is, if it applied to that problem, then that would, for me, be a big sign uh, that it's fundamental. So, yeah. Just to follow up, so there's no proof that this internal communication complexity is the exact quantity or within orders for direct sum. So it's just, this is the best thing you know right now. Oh, oh yeah, actually, you're right. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> yeah, that should have been my answer. So, uh, yeah, actually, we do know that that, that is the right quantity oh, okay. right. for direct sum. Yeah. So, so I, guess, I guess what I'm saying is that any other quantity that you use would have to be this one if it applied to the problems. Uh -huh. I'm thinking if the optimal mutual information shows up, then somehow you know the information theorist in me and maybe in others wants to know like what's the connection to some kind of operational product. So there, you know, so mm -hmm. the thing could be direct sum. That could be your problem. Or yeah. But there is an operational interpretation, which is you take the number of repetitions, you know, going off to infinity, mm -hmm. and then it's amortized. Yeah, there's an operational way to understand it. Yeah. Um, no, there, there's a lot. There's a lot more to say on this that I. <laughs> I guess I can't say it. Oh, okay. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, but that might ruin the information in general. Uh, actually, sorry, I take that back. That doesn't ruin the information. So forget it. Forget that. You can always fix the public. You can always just fix. Uh, you you can always just fix the. Okay. The, there, there are multiple issues here, which is that I'm struggling to answer. This. So what I said about public versus private, that, so if, if there's a distribution on inputs, you can get rid of all randomness, right? Just fix it to the best case. Now, if there's no distribution on inputs, if you want your protocol to work for every input with some error, then it's interesting to talk about public versus private. Okay, and then you can, uh, then this result I said, said that you can move from public to private. Uh, but uh, there is an ana analogous thing that you can do for information, and that's also been studied by uh, uh, Braverman and Garg. Uh, but I don't remember exactly what the results they proved there are. Was that your question, or did you have something else? No, I was just trying to make this protocol private rather than see why if you cycle it, it doesn't work. Uh, so ah, why do you? So the, the issue is if you take this protocol, uh, so the original protocol was low information, right? But this one, I have no guarantee about its information. Because here, you actually might learn much more than the bits that are sampled. You might learn information about the numbers. Okay, those numbers get, start to get revealed. And in fact, uh, there are counterexamples where a lot of information is revealed in the simulation. So you can't just repeat the idea. That's a good question. More questions? OK, so in the 10 minutes that I have left, what I'm going to do is try and show you uh, some applications, maybe one application 
is what I want to do for the whole lecture, but anyway. Uh, to uh, things that, have not, that may at first seem to have nothing to do with communication complexity. Um, and the, the first thing I want to talk about, so I mean, for me, that's, that's one of the main reasons I got interested in communication complexity, is that it seems to have many diverse applications to things that seem unrelated. Okay. Uh, so the first thing that I want to tell you about is this problem of understanding monotone circuit complexity. So, so what is a monotone circuit? It's uh, something like, that looks like this. So it has uh, here's an AND gate, here's an OR gate, uh, AND gate, okay, and some variables at the bottom, x1, x2, Three, four. So this is a circuit. You compute it by, you know, you feed in bits at the bottom, you apply these functions, and then you get an output. The circuit is monotone if there are no gates that do negations. All the gates are ands and ors. Okay. <clears throat> and what I want to prove to you is uh, using what we've talked about so far. In fact, this, uh, the lower bound and disjointness that we talked about yesterday. I'm going to show you that. Uh, uh, so I, actually, so let me let's let's think of a specific problem that you want to compute uh, in computer science, and that's the matching problem. So you're you're given uh, a graph, and you want to know uh, does the graph have a matching of size n? That's the question. And uh, so this is a monotone property. Okay, It can be computed by a monotone circuit. So you think of kind of putting in bits here, which encode the graph. So every bit says whether a specific edge is in the graph or not. And then you're trying to build a circuit, which will output whether or not the graph has a matching of size n. So matching means uh, disjoint edges. Okay. okay. So this is a matching of size uh, four. Uh, okay. And the theorem I want to prove uh, says that any monotone circuit for this problem. That's exactly what we want to ask. So how many nodes do you need in the graph? Oh, how many nodes does this that graph have? Yeah. Uh, so, in, uh, so uh, what's going to ha end up happening is we're a linear number of nodes. In uh, n. In n, yeah. So there's a graph on 10 n vertices, and we want to know is there a, a matching of size n? Okay. Okay. So uh, what I'm going to prove to you is that any monotone circuit uh, has uh, omega n. Uh, depth. Okay. The depth is the length of the longest input to output path. So that's what I want to show you. Okay, so this is the depth. Their indicator for the edges, yes. All right, so let me tell you the, the high level proof strategy here. Uh, <clears throat> so, j just so you understand, so this, this is the worst possible uh, depth because you can always compute any monotone function in depth n. So this says this is a, a really hard problem for monotone circuits to compute. OK. Now, here's, here's a trick that we'll use to go from circuits to communication protocols. So suppose, consider the following problem. Suppose Alice has uh, a graph GX uh, that has a matching.
and Bob has GY that has no matching of size n. Uh, then I claim that if you have a circuit like this of small depth, you can get an efficient protocol that will find an edge that's in Alice's graph but not in Bob's graph. Okay, if Alice has a matching and Bob does not have a matching, it, there must be an edge that's in Alice's graph that's not in Bob's graph, right? Uh, GX cannot be contained in GY. And you can use this circuit to find it quickly. Okay? Here's what you would do. <clears throat> Alice would evaluate the whole circuit and Bob would evaluate the whole circuit. Okay? And the output of the circuit will be different for the both of them. Right? Alice's evaluation will give a 1, Bob's will give a 1, uh, will give a 0. And that means, in particular, the top gate, which is an AND gate, both the inputs to Alice must be 1s. Right? So it's 1, 1, because the output is 1. And Bob must have a 0 that's coming in, because Bob's output is going to be 0. So Bob will send 1 bit to Alice, to indicate which of these two, you know, where the zero came from. So the zero came from here, Bob will say the zero came from the right side. So he'll send one bit. And then they repeat. So now, now they have this smaller circuit of depth that's one less, uh, where Alice's output is one and Bob's output is zero. And again, they can commu communicate one bit. So if this is, a, if this is an OR gate, then uh, it must be the case that Alice has a 1 in, his input, in her input, and Bob has both zeros. So Alice will send a bit to indicate uh, where the 1 came from. Okay, so in this way, they will go down the circuit, and after, if the depth is d, after d steps, they'll have found uh, an edge that, that's in Alice's input, but not in Bob's input. Okay. So that's the idea. And all I'm going to show you, so that means, the communication of this protocol is bounded by the depth of, 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 of the smallest circuit. Okay? So I'm just going to show you that solving this problem requires high communication. Uh, yeah, I hope I will be able to show you. And I'll do it by showing that if you can solve this problem, you can solve disjointness. Right? <clears throat> um, okay, so let's just do it. So now I'm going to give you a protocol for disjointness that will use that protocol as a black box. Okay. So Alice and Bob get uh, strings x and y. You know, x is a subset of n, uh, y is a subset of n. And they're going to do the following. So let's write, so say x is uh, this 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0. And uh, then I'm going to define, from this string, I'm going to define a graph, gx. And this is what the graph will look like. Everywhere that she sees a zero, she's going to put uh, something like, oh, probably got this wrong, all right. Uh, she's going to put, I believe she's going to do this. All right, I hope this will work out. Okay, so every time she gets a zero, she puts a, a wedge like this. Every time she gets a one, she puts a wedge like this. This is her whole graph. Uh, and you see, gx has a matching of size n, right? Because each one of these wedges contains one edge of the matching. And now the tricky part is describing Bob's graph. So say Bob has uh, 1, 0, 1, 0. Uh, then what Bob is going to do is... So say the intersection here, and ah, no, the other way. Section
Good. Depth to yeah yeah but here I'm forcing the circuits to be uh, fan in two oh, okay. yeah sorry so I forgot what this gadget looks like but hopefully <laughs> figure it out okay so, but this will be the graph of the same set of vertices yeah the same set of vertices okay, I'm running out of time but uh, so I think okay, so it's gonna be like this this. Uh, like this, like this, and here it's one, it's going to be this, and zero. This. What the small squares, what do they mean? I'm going to tell you. Ah, okay, it works. I don't know why I'm... Okay. Sorry. Let me explain what's going on. <laughs> okay, so I've defined a set of vertices S here. Okay. Uh, I've defined a set of vertices, which is these squares. So Bob, the first thing she, Bob does is he looks at his bits, and he defines this set of vertices. So if it's a 1, he takes the right vertex here. If it's a 0, he takes a left. 1, right, 0, left. Okay, the point of this is that if there's an intersection, the, that means that this square is going to hit the, the middle of the V. Okay? It's a node. Okay, so so far it's a, it's a node. I'm going to define now a graph. Okay? So but what Bob will do is, so Bob will compute the following. He'll compute a set S, which is all the squares minus J, uh, minus V, where V is a random vertex in the graph. Okay. And now, now I'm going to define a graph. So what is GY? So this is GX. And GY is going to be the set of edges, take all the edges that touch S. All right. <laughs> so now let's... So that's the construction of GX and GY, and let's see what happens. So first, suppose GX and GY uh, are intersecting, uh, or, or let's say they're not intersecting, okay? Then what's going to happen is, uh, what, what, what does GY look like? GY contains uh, all the edges that touch S, which means, uh, Uh, it's a random reduction, but you know I think I got this wrong. So I'm getting the non-intersections instead of the intersections. Gx. Okay. All right. So you know I'm going to give up. I'm going to tell you the idea. I forgot. I, I somehow messed up the gadget, the construction. Uh, the way the construction is supposed to work is that basically when there's a one-one, uh, the the set that you get will not touch one of the edges. Okay, so then you look at then you look at the the set of edges that touch the set, and if there's an intersection, there will be, uh, you know, b you you delete a random vertex, there will be sort of two candidate edges where one of them corresponds to the the intersection between x and y, and so what's going to happen is in this process, the probability that you find the intersection when you find this edge will be at least a half. So you just repeat this process. Uh, so somehow I, I messed up the gadget. I think I got the zeros and the ones flipped. Uh, but actually, it's okay. So, so I'll plug my book. <laughs> you should go to the web, my web page, and uh, this construction is written in that draft of the text, and it's written correctly. Uh, but I somehow misread what was what the gadget was. But there is no deterministic reduction. Yeah, that's that's actually what's interesting about this reduction. Yeah, so the reduction is not deterministic. It's to the randomized 
uh, problem. And, uh, and then you use the result that there is no randomized protocol to compute the joint. Yes. Right? Yeah. So that's the that's the overall strategy. Okay, I've gone over time, so I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you. <laughs>